Section eighteen of the House Without a Key by Alda Biggers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section eighteen. A cable from the mainland. John Quincy awoke at nine the following morning and slipped from under his mosquito netting, eager to face the responsibilities of a new day. On the floor near his bureau lay the letter designed to speed the parting guest. He picked it up and read it again with manifest enjoyment. When he reached the dining room, Haku informed him that Miss Minerva and Barbara had breakfasted early and gone to the city on a shopping tour. Look here, Haku, the boy said. A letter came for me late last night. Yes, admitted Haku. Who delivered it? Cannot say. It were on floor of hall close by big front door. Who found it? Kamaiku. Oh, yes, Kamaiku. I tell her to put it in your sleeping room. Did Kamaiku see the person who brought it? Nobody see him. Nobody on place. All right, John Quincy said. He spent a leisurely hour on the lanai with his pipe and the morning paper. About half-past ten he got out the roadster and drove to the police station. Hallett and Chan, he was told, were in a conference with the prosecutor. He sat down to wait, and in a few moments word came for him to join them. Entering Green's office, he saw the three men seated gloomily about the prosecutor's desk. "'Well, I guess I'm some detective,' he announced." Green looked up quickly. Found anything new? Not precisely, John Quincy admitted. But last night when I was walking along Kalakaua Avenue with a young woman, somebody took a couple of wild shots at me from the bushes, and when I got home I found this letter waiting. He handed the epistle to Hallett, who read it with evident disgust, then passed it on to the prosecutor. That doesn't get us anywhere, the captain said. It may get me somewhere if I'm not careful, John Quincy replied. However, I'm rather proud of it. Sort of goes to show that my detective work is hitting home. Maybe, answered Hallett carelessly. Green laid the letter on his desk. My advice to you, he said, is to carry a gun. That's unofficial, of course. Nonsense, I'm not afraid, John Quincy told him. I've got a pretty good idea who sent this thing. You have? Green said. Yes, he's a friend of Captain Hallett's, Dick Kohler. What do you mean, he's a friend of mine? Flared Hallett. Well, you certainly treated him pretty tenderly the other night. I knew what I was doing, said Hallett grouchily. I hope you did. But if he puts a bullet in me some lovely evening, I'm going to be pretty annoyed with you. Oh, you're in no danger. Hallett answered. Only a coward writes anonymous letters. Yes, and only a coward shoots from ambush. But that isn't saying he can't take a good aim. Hallett picked up the letter. I'll keep this. It may prove to be evidence. Surely, agreed John Quincy. And you haven't got any too much evidence as I see it. Is that so? growled Hallett. We've made a rather important discovery about that Corsican cigarette. Oh, I'm not saying Charlie isn't good, smiled John Quincy. I was with him when he worked that out. A uniformed man appeared at the door. Egan and his daughter and Captain Cope, he announced to Green. Want to see them now, sir? Send them in, ordered the prosecutor. I'd like to stay if you don't mind, John Quincy suggested. Oh, by all means, Green answered. We couldn't get along without you. The policeman brought Egan to the door, and the proprietor of the Reef and Palm came into the room. His face was haggard and pale. His long siege with the authorities had begun to tell. But a stubborn light still flamed in his eyes. After him came Carlotta Egan, fresh and beautiful, and with a new air of confidence about her. Captain Cope followed, tall, haughty, a man of evident power and determination. This is the prosecutor, I believe, he said. "'Ah, Mr. Winterslip, I find you everywhere I go. "'You don't mind me staying?' inquired John Quincy. "'Not in the least, my boy. "'Our business here will take but a moment.' "'He turned to Green. "'Just as a preliminary,' he continued, "'I am Captain Arthur Temple Cope of the British Admiralty, "'and this gentleman,' he nodded toward the proprietor of the Reef and Palm, "'is my brother.' "'Really?' said Green. 
His name is Egan, as I understand it. His name is James Egan Cope, the captain replied. He dropped the cope many years ago for reasons that do not concern us now. I am here simply to say, sir, that you were holding my brother on the flimsiest pretext I have ever encountered in the course of my rather extensive travels. If necessary, I propose to engage the best lawyer in Honolulu and have him free by night. But I am giving you this last chance to release him and avoid a somewhat painful expose of the sort of nonsense you go in for. John Quincy glanced at Colotta Egan. Her eyes were shining, but not on him. They were on her uncle. Green flushed slightly. A good bluff, Captain, is always worth trying, he said. Oh, then you admit you have been bluffing, said Cope quickly. I was referring to your attitude, sir, Green replied. Oh, I see, Cope said. I'll sit down if you don't mind. As I understand it, you have two things against old Jim here. One is that he visited Dan Winterslip on the night of the murder, and now refuses to divulge the nature of that call. The other is the stub of a Corsican cigarette which was found by the walk outside the door of Winterslip's living room. Green shook his head. Only the first, he responded. The Corsican cigarette is no longer evidenced against Egan. He leaned suddenly across his desk. It is, my dear Captain Cope, evidence against you. Cope met his look unflinchingly. Really? he remarked. John Quincy noted a flash of startled bewilderment in Colotta Egan's eyes. That's what I said, Green continued. I'm very glad you dropped in this morning, sir. I've been wanting to talk to you. I've been told that you were heard to express a strong dislike for Dan Winterslip. I may have. I certainly felt it. Why? As a midshipman on a British warship, I was familiar with Australian gossip in the eighties. Mr. Dan Winterslip had an unsavoury reputation. It was rumoured on good authority that he rifled the sea chest of his dead captain on the Maid of Shiloh. Perhaps we're a bit squeamish, but that is the sort of thing we sailors cannot forgive. There were other quaint deeds in connection with his blackbirding activities. Yes, my dear sir, I heartily dislike Dan Winterslip, and if I haven't said so before, I say it now. You arrived in Honolulu a week ago, Green continued. At noon, Monday noon, you left the following day. Did you by any chance call on Dan Winterslip during that period? I did not. Ah, yes. I may tell you, sir, that the Corsican cigarettes found in Egan's case were of Turkish tobacco. The stub found near the scene of Dan Winterslip's murder was of Virginia tobacco. So also, my dear Captain Cope, was the Corsican cigarette you gave our man Charlie Chan in the lobby of the Alexander Young Hotel last Sunday night. Cope looked at Chan and smiled. Always the detective, eh? he said. Never mind that, Green cried. I'm asking for an explanation. The explanation is very simple, Cope replied. I was about to give it to you when you launched into this silly cross-examination. The Corsican cigarette found by Dan Winterslip's door was naturally of Virginia tobacco. I never smoke any other kind. What? There can be no question about it, sir. I dropped that cigarette there myself. But you just told me you didn't call on Dan Winterslip. That was true, I didn't. I called on Miss Minerva Winterslip of Boston, who is the guest in the house. As a matter of fact, I had tea with her last Monday at five o'clock. You may verify that by telephoning the lady. Green glanced at Hallett, who glanced at the telephone, then turned angrily to John Quincy. Why the devil didn't she tell me that? he demanded. John Quincy smiled. I don't know, sir. Possibly because she never thought of Captain Cope in connection with the murder. She'd hardly be likely to, Cope said. Miss Winterslip and I had tea in the living room, then went out and sat on a bench in the garden, chatting over old times. When I returned to the house, I was smoking a cigarette. I dropped it just outside the living room door. Whether Miss Winterslip noted my action or not, I don't know. She probably didn't. It isn't the sort of thing one remembers. You may call her on the telephone if you wish, sir. Again Green looked at Hallett, who shook his head. I'll talk with her later announced the captain of detectives. Evidently Miss Minerva had an unpleasant interview ahead. At any rate, Cope continued to the prosecutor, you had yourself disposed of the cigarette as evidence against old Jim. That leaves only the fact of his silence. His silence, yes, Green cut in. 
and the fact that Winterslip had been heard to express a fear of Jim Egan. Cope frowned. Had he really? He considered a moment. Well, what of it? Winterslip had good reason to fear a great many honest men. No, my dear sir, you have nothing to save my brother's silence against him, and that is not enough. I demand— Green raised his hand. Just a minute. I said you were bluffing, and I still think so. Any other assumption would be an insult to your intelligence. Surely you know enough about the law to understand that your brother's refusal to tell me his business with Winterslip, added to the fact that he was presumably the last person to see Winterslip alive, is sufficient excuse for holding him. I can hold him on those grounds. I am holding him, and, my dear Captain, I shall continue to hold him until hell freezes over. Very good, said Cope, rising. I shall engage a capable lawyer. That is, of course, your privilege, snapped Green. Good morning. Cope hesitated. He turned to Egan. It means more publicity, Jim, he said. Delay, too. More unhappiness for Carlotta here. And since everything you did was done for her. How did you know that? asked Egan quickly. I've guessed it. I can put two and two together, Jim. Carlotta was to return with me for a bit of schooling in England. You said you had the money, but you hadn't. That was your pride again, Jim. It's got you into a lifetime of trouble. You cast about with the funds, and you remembered Winterslip. I'm beginning to see it all now. You had something on Dan Winterslip, and you went to his house that night to, uh, to blackmail him, suggested Green. It wasn't a pretty thing to do, Jim, Cope went on. But you weren't doing it for yourself. Clotter and I know you would have died first. You did it for your girl, and we both forgive you. He turned to Clotter. Don't we, my dear? The girl's eyes were wet. She rose and kissed her father. Dear old dad, she said. Come on, Jim, pleaded Captain Cope. Forget your pride for once. Speak up, and we'll take you home with us. I'm sure the prosecutor will keep the thing from the newspapers. We've promised him that a thousand times, Green said. Egan lifted his head. I don't care anything about the newspapers. It's you, Arthur. You and Carrie. I didn't want you two to know. But since you've guessed and Carrie knows too, I may as well tell everything. John Quincy stood up. Mr. Egan, he said. I'll leave the room if you wish. Sit down, my boy, Egan replied. Carrie's told me of your kindness to her. Besides, you saw the check. What was that? cried Hallett. He leaped to his feet and stood over John Quincy. I was on a bound not to tell, explained the boy gently. You don't say so, Hallett bellowed. You're a fine pair, you and that aunt of yours. One minute, Hallett, cut in Green. Now, Egan or Cope, whatever your name happens to be, I'm waiting to hear from you. Egan nodded. Back in the eighties I was teller in a bank in Melbourne, Australia, he said. One day a young man came to my window. Williams, or some such name, he called himself. He had a green hide bag full of gold pieces, Mexican, Spanish, and English coins, some of them crusted with dirt, and he wanted to exchange them for bank notes. I made the exchange for him. He appeared several times with similar bags, and the transaction was repeated. I thought little of it at the time, though the fact that he tried to give me a large tip did rather rouse my suspicion. A year later, when I had left the bank and gone to Sydney, I heard rumours of what Dan Winterslip had done on the Maid of Shiloh. It occurred to me that Williams and Winterslip were probably the same man, but no one seemed to be prosecuting the case. The general feeling was that it was blood money anyhow, that Tom Braid had not come by it honestly himself, so I said nothing. Twelve years later I came to Hawaii, and Dan Winterslip was pointed out to me. He was Williams right enough, and he knew me too. But I'm not a blackmailer. I've been in some tight places, Arthur, but I've always played fair, so I let the matter drop. For more than twenty years nothing happened. Then a few months ago my family located me at last, and Arthur here wrote me that he was coming to Honolulu and would look me up. I'd always felt that I had not done the right thing by my girl, that she was not taking the place in the world to which she was entitled. I wanted her to visit my old mother and get a bit of English training. I wrote to Arthur, and it was arranged. But I couldn't let her go as a charity child. I couldn't admit I'd failed and was unable to do anything for her. I said I'd pay her way. And I... 
I didn't have a cent. And then Braid came. It seemed providential. I might have sold my information to him, but when I talked with him I found he had very little money, and I felt that Winterslip would beat him in the end. No, Winterslip was my man, Winterslip with his rotten wealth. I don't know just what happened. I was quite mad, I fancy. The world owed me that. I figure, just for my girl, not for me. I called Winterslip up and made an appointment for that Monday night. But somehow the standards of a lifetime... It's difficult to change. The moment I had called him I regretted it. I tried to slip out of it. I told myself there must be some other way. Perhaps I could sell the reef and palm. Anyhow, I called him again and said I wasn't coming, but he insisted and I went. I didn't have to tell him what I wanted. He knew. He had a check ready for me, a check for five thousand dollars. It was Carrie's happiness, her chance. I took it and came away but I was ashamed. I'm not trying to excuse my action. However, I don't believe I would ever have cashed it. When Carrie found it in my desk and brought it to me, I tore it up. That's all. He turned his tired eyes toward his daughter. I did it for you, Carrie, but I didn't want you to know. She went over and put her arm about his shoulder and stood smiling down at him through her tears. If you had told us that in the first place said Green. You could have saved everybody a lot of trouble, yourself included. Cope stood up. Well, Mr. Prosecutor, there you are. You're not going to hold him now. Green rose briskly. No, I'll arrange for his release at once. He and Egan went out together, then Hallett and Cope. John Quincy held out his hand to Colotta Egan, for by that name he thought of her still. I'm mighty glad for you, he said. You'll come and see me soon, she asked. You'll find a very different girl, more like the one you met on the Oakland ferry. She was very charming, John Quincy replied. But then, she was bound to be. She had your eyes. He suddenly remembered Agatha Parker. However, you've got your father now, he added. You won't need me. She looked up at him and smiled. I wonder, she said, and went out. John Quincy turned to Chan. Well, that's that, he remarked. Where are we now? Speaking personally for myself, grinned Chand, I am static in same place as usual. Never did have fondly feeling for Egan theory. But Hallett did, John Quincy answered. A black morning for him. In the small ante-room they encountered the captain of detectives. He appeared disgruntled. We were just remarking, said John Quincy pleasantly, that there goes your little old Egan theory. What have you left? Oh, I've got plenty, growled Hallett. Yes, you have. One by one your clues have gone up in smoke. The page from the guest book, the brooch, the torn newspaper, the Ohio wood box, and now Egan and the Corsican cigarette. Oh, Egan isn't out of it. We may not be able to hold him, but I'm not forgetting, Mr. Egan. Nonsense, smiled John Quincy. I asked what you had left. A little button from a glove. Useless. The glove was destroyed long ago. A wrist watch with an illuminated dial and a damaged numeral, too. Chan's amber eyes narrowed. Essential clue, he murmured. Remember how I said it. Hallett banged his fist on the table. That's it, the wrist watch. If the person who wore it knows anyone saw it, it's probably where we'll never find it. But we've kept it pretty dark. Perhaps he doesn't know. That's our only chance. He returned to Chan. I've combed these islands once hunting that watch, he cried. Now I'm going to start all over again. The jewellery stores, the pawn shops, every nook and corner. You go out, Charlie, and start the ball rolling. Chan moved with alacrity despite his weight. I will give it one powerful push, he promised, and disappeared. Well, good luck, said John Quincy, moving on. Hallett grunted. You tell that aunt of yours I'm pretty sore, he remarked. He was not in the mood for elegance of diction. John Quincy's opportunity to deliver the message did not come at lunch, for Miss Minerva remained with Barbara in the city. After dinner that evening he led his aunt out to sit on the bench under the how-tree. By the way, he said, Captain Hallett is very much annoyed with you. I am very much annoyed with Captain Hallett, she replied, so that makes us even. What's his particular grievance now? He believes you knew all the time the name of the man who dropped that Corsican cigarette. She was silent for a moment. Not all the time, she said at length. 
What has happened? John Quincy sketched briefly the events of the morning at the police station. When he had finished, he looked at her inquiringly. In the first excitement I didn't remember, or I should have spoken, she explained. It was several days before the thing came to me. I saw it clearly then. Arthur, Captain Cope, tossing that cigarette aside as we re-entered the house. But I said nothing about it. Why? Well, I thought it would be a good test for the police. Let them discover it for themselves. That's a pretty weak explanation, remarked John Quincy severely. You have been responsible for a lot of wasted time. It, it wasn't my only reason, said Miss Minerva softly. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Go on. Somehow I couldn't bring myself to link up that call of Captain Cope's with a murder mystery. Another silence, and suddenly, he was never dense, John Quincy understood. He told me that you were very beautiful in the eighties, said the boy gently. The captain, I mean. When I met him in that San Francisco club, Miss Minerva laid her own hand on the boy's. When she spoke, her voice, which he had always thought firm and sharp, trembled a little. On this beach in my girlhood, she said, happiness was within my grasp. I had only to reach out and take it. But somehow Boston, Boston held me back. I let my happiness slip away. Not too late yet, suggested John Quincy. She shook her head. So he tried to tell me that Monday afternoon, but there was something in his tone. I may be in Hawaii, but I'm not quite mad. Youth, John Quincy, youth doesn't return, whatever they may say out here. He pressed his hand and stood. If your chance comes, dear boy, she added, don't be such a fool. She moved hastily away through the garden, and John Quincy looked after her with a new affection in his eyes. Presently he saw the yellow glare of a match beyond the wire. Amos again, still loitering under his algaroba tree. John Quincy rose and strolled over to him. Hello, cousin Amos, he said. When are you going to take down this fence? Oh, I'll get around to it sometime, Amos answered. By the way, I wanted to ask you, any new developments? Several, John Quincy told him, but nothing that gets us anywhere. So far as I can see, the case has blown up completely. Well, I've been thinking it over, Amos said. Maybe that would be the best outcome after all. Suppose they do discover who did for Dan. It might only reveal a new scandal worse than any of the others. I'll take a chance on that, replied John Quincy. For my part, I intend to see this thing through. Haku came briskly through the garden. Cable message from Mr. John Quincy Winterslip. Boy say collect. Request money. John Quincy followed quickly to the front door. A bored small boy awaited him. He paid the sum due and tore open the cable. It was signed by the postmaster at Des Moines, and it read, No one named Saladin ever heard of here. John Quincy dashed to the telephone. Someone on duty at the station informed him that Chan had gone home and gave him an address on Punchbowl Hill. He got out the roadster and in five minutes more was speeding toward the city. End of section 18「Section 20 of The House Without a Key by Alda Biggers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 20 the story of Lao Ho. Early Sunday morning John Quincy was awakened by a sharp knock on his door. Rising sleepily and donning dressing gown and slippers, he opened it to admit his Aunt Minerva. She had a worried air. Are you all right, John Quincy? she inquired. Surely, that is, I would be if I hadn't been dragged out of bed a full hour before I intended to get up. I'm sorry, but I had to look at you. She took a newspaper from under her arm and handed it to him. What's all this? An eight-column head on the first page caught even John Quince's sleepy eye. Boston man has strange adventure on waterfront. Smaller heads announced that Mr. John Quincy Winterslip had been rescued from an unwelcome trip to China in the nick of time by three midshipmen from the Oregon. Poor Pete Maybury. He had been the real hero of the affair, but his own paper would not come out again until Monday evening, and rivals had beaten him to the story. John Quincy yawned. 
all true, my dear, he said. I was on the verge of leaving you when the Navy saved me. Life, you perceive, has become a musical comedy. But why should anyone want to shanghai you? cried Miss Minerva. Ah, I hope you'd ask me that. It happens that your nephew has a brain. His keen analytical work as a detective is getting someone's goat. He admitted as much in a letter he sent me the night he took a few shots at my head. Someone shot at you? gasped Miss Minerva. I'll say so. You rather fancy yourself as a sleuth, but is anybody taking aim at you from behind bushes? Answer me that. Miss Minerva sat down weakly on a chair. You're going home on the next boat, she announced. He laughed. About two weeks ago I made that suggestion to you. And what was your reply? Ah, my dear, the tables are turned. I'm not going home on the next boat. I may never go home. This gay, carefree, sudden country begins to appeal to me. Let me read about myself. He returned to the paper. The clock was turned back thirty years on the Honolulu waterfront last night began the somewhat imaginative account. It closed with the news that the tramp steamer Mary S. Allison had left port before the police could board her. Evidently she had had steam up and papers ready, and was only awaiting the return of the red-haired man and his victim. John Quincy handed the newspaper back to his aunt. Too bad, he remarked. They slipped through Hallett's fingers. Of course they did, she snapped. Everybody does. I'd like to talk with Captain Hallett. If I could only tell him what I think of him, I'd feel better. Save that paper, John Quincy said. I want to send it to Mother. She stared at him. Are you mad? Poor Grace. She'd have a nervous breakdown. Only hope she doesn't hear of this until you're back in Boston safe and sound. Oh, yes, Boston, laughed John Quincy. Quaint old town, they tell me. I must visit there some day. Now, if you'll leave me a minute, I'll prepare to join you at breakfast and relate the story of my adventurous life. Very well, agreed Miss Minerva, rising. She paused at the door. A little witch hazel might help your face. The scars of honourable battle, said her nephew. Why remove them? Honourable fiddlesticks, Miss Minerva answered. After all, the back bay has its good points. But in the hall outside she smiled a delighted little smile. When John Quincy and his aunt were leaving the dining room after breakfast, Kamaiku, stiff and dignified in a freshly laundered hollow coup, approached the boy. So very happy to see you safe this morning, she announced. Why, thank you, Kamaiku, he answered. He wondered, was Kola responsible for his troubles, and if so, did this huge silent woman know of her grandson's activities? Poor thing! Miss Minerva said as they entered the living room. She's been quite downcast since Dan went. I'm sorry for her. I've always liked her. Naturally, smiled John Quincy. There's a bond between you. What's that? Two vanishing races, yours and hers, the Boston Brahman and the pure Hawaiian. Later in the morning, Carlotta Egan telephoned him, greatly excited. She had just seen the Sunday paper. All true he admitted. While you were dancing your heart out, I was struggling to sidestep a cook's tour of the Orient. I shouldn't have had a happy moment if I'd known. Then I'm glad you didn't. Big party, I suppose. Yes, you know, I've been terribly worried about you ever since that night on the avenue. I want to talk with you. Will you come to see me? Will I? I'm on my way already. He hung up the receiver and hastened down the beach. Colotta was sitting on the white sand not far from the reef and palm, all in white herself. A serious, wide-eyed Colotta, quite different from the gay girl who had been hurrying to a party the night before. John Quincy dropped down beside her, and for a time they talked of the dance and of his adventure. Suddenly she turned to him. I have no right to ask it, I know, but I want you to do something for me. It will make me very happy, anything you ask. Go back to Boston. What? Not that. I was wrong. That wouldn't make me happy. Yes, it would. You don't think so now, perhaps. You're dazzled by the sun out here, but this isn't your kind of place. We're not your kind of people. You'd think like us, but you'd soon forget. Back among your own sort, the sort who are interested in the things that interest you. Please go. It would be retreating under fire, he objected. 
but you proved your courage last night. I'm afraid for you. Someone out here has a terrible grudge against you. I'd never forgive Hawaii if, if anything happened to you. That's sweet of you. He moved closer. But confound it, there was Agatha, bound to Agatha by all the ties of honour. He edged away again. I'll think about it, he agreed. I'm leaving Honolulu too, you know, she reminded him. I know, you'll have a wonderful time in England. She shook her head. Oh, I dread the whole idea. Dad's heart is set on it and I shall go to please him, but I shan't enjoy it. I'm not up to England. Nonsense. No, I'm not. I'm unsophisticated, crude, really, just a girl of the islands. But you wouldn't care to stay here all your life. No, indeed. It's a beautiful spot to loll about in, but I've too much northern blood to be satisfied with that. One of these days I want Dad to sell and we'll go to the mainland. I could get some sort of work. Any particular place on the mainland? Well, I haven't been about much, of course, but all the time I was at school I kept thinking I'd rather live in San Francisco than anywhere else in the world. Good, John Quincy cried. That's my choice, too. You remember that morning on the ferry, how you held out your hand to me and said, Welcome to your city. But you corrected me at once. You said you belonged in Boston. I see my error now. She shook her head. A moment's sadness, but you'll recover. You're an Easterner, and you could never be happy anywhere else. Oh, yes, I could, he assured her. I'm a winter slip, a wandering winter slip. Any old place we hang our hats. This time he did lean rather close. I could be happy anywhere, he began. He wanted to add, with you, but Agatha's slim patrician hand was on his shoulder. Anywhere he repeated with a different inflection. A gong sounded from the reef and palm. Carlotta rose. That's lunch. John Quincy stood too. It's beside the point where you go, she went on. I asked you to do something for me. I know. If you'd asked anything else in the world, I'd be up to my neck in it now. But what you suggest would take a bit of doing to leave Hawaii and say good-bye to you. I meant to be very firm about it, she broke in. But I must have a little time to consider. Will you wait? She smiled up at him. You're so much wiser than I am, she said. Yes, I'll wait. He went slowly along the beach, unsophisticated, yes, and charming. You're so much wiser than I am. Where on the mainland could one encounter a girl nowadays who would say that? He had quite forgotten that she smiled when she said it. In the afternoon John Quincy visited the police station. Hallett was in his room in rather a grouchy mood. Chan was out somewhere hunting the watch. No, they hadn't found it yet. John Quincy was mildly reproving. "'Well, you saw it, didn't you?' growled Hallett. "'Why in Sam Hill didn't you grab it?' "'Because they tied my hands,' John Quincy reminded him. I've narrowed the search down for you to the taxi drivers of Honolulu. Hundreds of them, my boy. More than that, I've given you the first two numbers on the license plate of the car. If you're any good at all, you ought to be able to land that watch now. Oh, we'll land it, Hallett said. Give us time. Time was just what John Quincy had to give them. Monday came and went. Miss Minerva was bitterly sarcastic. Patience are a very lovely virtue. John Quincy told her. I got that from Charlie. At any rate, she snapped, it are a virtue very much needed with Captain Hallett in charge. In another direction, too, John Quincy was called upon to exercise patience. Agatha Parker was unaccountably silent regarding that short, peremptory cable he had sent on his big night in town. Was she offended? The Parkers were notoriously not a family who accepted dictation. But in such a vital matter as this, a girl should be willing to listen to reason. Late Tuesday afternoon, Chan telephoned from the station house. Unquestionably Chan this time. Would John Quincy do him the great honour to join him for an early dinner at the Alexander Young Caff? Something doing, Charlie, cried the boy eagerly. Maybe it might be, answered Chan, and maybe also not. At six o'clock in hotel lobby, if you will so far condescend. I'll be there, John Quincy promised, and he was. 
He greeted Chan with anxious, inquiring eyes, but Chan was suave and entirely non-committal. He led John Quincy to the dining room and carefully selected a table by a front window. "'Do me the great favour to recline,' he suggested. John Quincy reclined. "'Charlie, don't keep me in suspense,' he pleaded. Chan smiled. "'Let us not shade the feast with gloomy murder talk,' he replied. "'This our social meeting. It is that you are in the mood to dry up plate of soup?' "'Why, yes, of course,' John Quincy answered. Politeness, he saw, dictated that he hide his curiosity. Two of the soup,' ordered Chan of a white-jacketed waiter. A car drew up to the door of the Alexander Young. Chan half rose, staring at it keenly. He dropped back to his seat. "'It is my high delight to entertain you thus humbly before you are restored to Boston. Converse at some length of Boston. I feel interested.' "'Really?' smiled the boy. "'Undubitably.' "'Gentlemen, I meet once say Boston are like China. "'The future of both, he say, lies in graveyards "'where repose useless bodies of honoured guests on high. "'I am fogged as to meaning.' "'He meant both places live in the past,' John Quincy explained, "'and he was right in a way. "'Boston, like China, boasts a glorious history. "'But that's not saying the Boston of today isn't progressive. "'Why do you know?' "'He talked eloquently of his native city.' Chan listened, rapt. Always, he sighed when John Quincy finished, I have unlimited yearning for travel. He paused to watch another car draw up before the hotel. But it are unavailable. I am policeman on small remuneration. In my youth rambling on evening hillside or by moonly ocean, I dream of more lofty position. Not so now. But that other American citizen, my eldest son, he are dreaming too. Maybe for him dreams eventuate. Perhaps he becomes second baby Ruth, home-run emperor, applause of thousands making him deaf. Who knows it? The dinner passed, unshaded by gloomy talk, and they went outside. Chan proffered a cigar, of which he spoke in the most belittling fashion. He suggested that they stand for a time before the hotel door. Waiting for somebody? inquired John Quincy, unable longer to dissemble. Precisely the fact. Belly dared to mention it, however. Great disappointment may drive up here any minute now. An open car stopped before the hotel entrance. John Quincy's eyes sought the license plate, and he got an immediate thrill. The first two figures were thirty-three. A party of tourists, a man and two women, alighted. The doorman ran forward and busied himself with luggage. Chang casually strolled across the walk, and as a Japanese driver shifted his gears preparatory to driving away, put a restraining hand on the car door. "'One moment, please,' the driver turned, fright in his eyes. "'You are Okuda from Auto Stand across way?' "'Yes,' hissed the driver. "'You will now return from Exploring Island with party of tourists. You leave this spot early Sunday morning?' "'Yes. Is it possible that you wear wristwatch, please?' Yes. Deign to reveal face of same. The Jap hesitated. Chan leaned far over into the car and thrust aside the man's coat sleeve. He came back, a pleased light in his eye, and held open the rear door. Kindly embark into tonneau, Mr. Winterslip. Obediently, John Quincy got in. Chan took his place by the driver's side. The police station, if you will be so kind. The car leaped forward. The essential clue. They had it at last. John Quincy's heart beat fast there in the rear of the car where only a few nights before he had been bound and gagged. Captain Hallett's grim face relaxed into happy lines when he met them at the door of his room. You got him, eh? Good work. He glanced at the prisoner's wrist. Rip that watch off him, Charlie. Charlie obeyed. He examined the watch for a moment, then he handed it to his chief. Inexpensive timepiece of noted brand, he announced. Numeral too faint and far away. One other fact emerge into light. This Japanese man have small wrist, yet worn place on strap convey impression of being worn by man with wrist of vastly larger circumference. Hallard nodded. Yes, that's right. Some other man has owned this watch. He had a big wrist, but most men in Honolulu have, you know. 
Sit down, Akuda. I want to hear from you. You understand what it means to lie to me. I do not lie, sir. No, you bet your sweet life you don't. First, tell me who engaged your car last Saturday night. Saturday night? That's what I said. Ah, oh, yes, two sailors from ship, engaged for evening paying large cash at once. I drive to shop on River Street, wait long time, then off we go to dock with extra passenger in back. Know the name of those sailors? Could not say. What ship were they from? How can I know? Not told. All right, I'm coming to the important thing. Understand? The truth. That's what I want. Where did you get this watch? Chan and John Quincy leaned forward eagerly. I buy him, said the Jap. You bought him? Where? At Jewel Store on Chinese Lao Ho on Malkania Street. Hallett turned to Chan. You know the place, Charlie? Chan nodded. Yes, indeed. Open now? Open until hour of ten, maybe more. Good, said Hallett. Come along, Akuda. You can drive us there. Lao Ho, a little wizened Chinese man, sat back of his workbench with a microscope screwed into one dim old eye. The four men who entered his tiny store filled it to overflowing, but he gave them barely a glance. Come on, Ho, wake up! Callot cried. I want to talk to you. With the utmost deliberation, Lao Ho descended from his stool and approached the counter. He regarded Hallett with a hostile eye. The captain laid the wristwatch on top of a showcase in which reposed many trays of jade. Ever seen that before? he inquired. Lao Ho regarded it casually. Slowly he raised his eyes. Maybe so, cannot say, he replied in a high, squeaky voice. Hallett reddened. Nonsense! You had it here in the store and you sold it to this fellow now, didn't you? Lao Ho dreamily regarded the taxi driver. Maybe so. Cannot say. Damn it! cried Hallett. You know who I am. Policeman, maybe. Policeman, maybe, yes, and I want you to tell me about this watch. Now wake up and come across or by the Lord Harry. Chan laid a deferential hand on his chief's arm. Humbly suggest I attempt this, he said. Hallett nodded. All right, it's your meat, Charlie. He drew back. Chan bowed with a great show of politeness. He launched into a long story in Chinese. Lao Ho looked at him with slight interest. Presently he squeaked a brief reply. Chan resumed his flow of talk. Occasionally he paused and Lao Ho spoke. In a few moments Chan turned, beaming. Story are now completely extracted like aching tooth, he said. Wristwatch was brought to Lao Ho on Thursday, same week as murder. Offered him on sale by a young man darkly coloured with small knife scar, marring cheek. Lao Ho buy and repair watch, interior works being in injured state. Saturday morning he sell at seemly profit to Japanese, presumably this Okoda here, but Lao Ho will not swear. Saturday night, dark young man appear much overwhelmed with excitement and demand watch again, please. Lao Ho say he sold it to Japanese. Which Japanese? Lao Ho is not aware of name and cannot describe all Japanese faces being uninteresting outlook for him. Dark young man curse and fly appear frequently demanding any news but Lao Ho is unable to oblige such a story of this jewel merchant here. They went out on the street. Hallett scowled at the Japanese man. All right, run along. I'll keep the watch. Very thankful, said the taxi driver and leapt into his car. Hallett turned to Chan. A dark young man with a scar, he queried. Clear enough to me, Chan answered. Same other Spaniard, Jose Cabrera, careless man about town with reputation not so savoury. Mr. Winterslip, is it that you have forgotten him? John Quincy started. Me? Did I ever see him? Recall, said Chan. It are the night following murder. You and I linger in all-American restaurant engaged in debate regarding hygiene of pie. Door open, admitting Bowker, steward on President Tyler, joyously full of Ocolau. With him a dark young man, this Jose Cabrera himself. Oh, I remember now, John Quincy answered. Well, the Spaniard's easy to pick up, said Hallett. I'll have him inside an hour. 
"'One moment, please,' interposed Chan. "'Tomorrow morning at nine o'clock the President Tyler returned from Orient. "'No gambler myself, but will wager incredible sum Spaniard waits on dock for Mr. Bowker. "'If you present no fierce objection, I have a yearning to arrest him at that very moment.' "'Why, of course,' agreed Hallett. "'He looked keenly at Charlie Chan. "'Charlie, you old rascal, you've got the scent at last.' "'Who, me?' grinned Chan. "'With your gracious permission I would alter the picture. "'Stone walls are crumbling now like dust. "'Through many loopholes light stream in like rosy streaks of dawn. "'End of section 20section twenty one of the house without a key by alda biggers this librivox recording is in the public domain section twenty one the stone walls crumble the stone walls were crumbling and the light streaming through but only for chan john quincy was still groping in the dark and his reflections were a little better as he returned to the house at wakiki Chan and he had worked together, but now that they approached the crisis of their efforts, the detective evidently preferred to push on alone, leaving his fellow worker to follow if he could. Well, so be it. But John Quince's pride was touched. He had suddenly a keen desire to show Chan that he could not be left behind like that. If only he could, by some inspirational flash of deductive reasoning, arrive at the solution of the mystery simultaneously with the detective for the honour of Boston and the winter slips. Frowning deeply, he considered all the old discarded clues again, the people who had been under suspicion and then dropped, Egan, the Compton woman, Braid, Cola, Leatherby, Saladin, Cope. He even considered several the investigation had not touched. Presently he came to Bowker. What did Bowker's reappearance mean? For the first time in two weeks he thought of the little man with the fierce pompadour and the gold-rimmed eyeglasses. Bowker with his sorrowful talk of vanished bar-rooms and lost friends behind the bar. How was the steward on the President Tyler connected with the murder of Dan Winterslip? He had not done it himself, that was obvious, but in some way he was linked up with the crime. John Quincy spent a long and painful period seeking to join Bowker up with one or another of the suspects. It couldn't be done. All through that Tuesday evening the boy puzzled, so silent and distrait, that Miss Minerva finally gave him up and retired to her room with a book. He awoke on Wednesday morning with the problem no nearer solution. Barbara was due to arrive at ten o'clock from Cowie, and taking the small car John Quincy went downtown to meet her. Pausing at the bank to cash a cheque, he encountered his old shipmate on the President Tyler, the sprightly Madame Maynard. "'I really shouldn't speak to you,' she said. "'You never come to see me.' "'I know,' he answered. "'But I've been so very busy. So I hear, running round with policemen and their victims. I have no doubt you'll go back to Boston and report we're all criminals and cutthroats out here.' "'Oh, hardly that.' "'Yes, you will.' You're getting a very biased view of Honolulu. Why not stoop to associate with a respectable person now and then? I'd enjoy it, if they're all like you. Like me? They're much more intelligent and charming than I am. Some of them are dropping in at my home tonight. For an informal little party, a bit of a chat, and then a moonlight swim. Won't you come too? I want to, of course, John Quincy replied. But there's Cousin Dan. Her eyes flashed. I'll say it even if he was your relative. Ten minutes of mourning for Cousin Dan is ample. I'll be looking for you. John Quincy laughed. I'll come. Do, she answered, and bring your Aunt Minerva. Tell her I said she might as well be dead as hogtied by convention. John Quincy went out to the corner of Fort and King Streets, near which he had parked the car. As he was about to climb into it, he paused. A familiar figure was jauntily crossing the street. The figure of Bowker, the steward, and with him was Willie Chan, demon backstopper of the Pacific. Hello, Bowker, John Quincy called. Mr. Bowker came blithely to join him. Well, 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 my old friend Mr. Winterslip. Shake hands with William Chan, the local tie cop. Mr. Chan and I have met before. 
John Quincy told him. Know all the celebrities, eh? That's good. Well, we missed you on the President Tyler. Bowker was evidently quite sober. Just got in, I take it, John Quincy remarked. A few minutes ago, how about joining us? He came closer and lowered his voice. This intelligent young man tells me he knows a taxi stand out near the beach where one may obtain a superior brand of fusel oil with a very pretty label on the bottle. Sorry, John Quincy answered. My cousin's coming in shortly on an inter-island boat and I'm elected to meet her. I'm sorry too, said the graduate of Dublin University. If my strength holds out, I'm aiming to stage quite a little party and I'd like to have you in on it. Yes, a rather large affair in memory of Tim, and as a last long, lingering farewell to the seven seas. What, your pow? Pow it is, when I sail out of here tonight at nine on the old P.T., I am through for ever. You don't happen to know a good country newspaper that can be brought for, well, say ten grand? This is rather sudden, isn't it? John Quincy inquired. This is sudden country out here, sir. Well, we must roll along. Sorry you can't join us. If the going's not too rough and I can find a nice smooth table top, I intend to turn down an empty glass. For poor old Tim. So long, sir, and happy days. He nodded to Willie Chan, and they went on down the street. John Quincy stood staring after them, a puzzled expression on his face. Bob seemed paler and thinner than ever, but she announced that her visit had been an enjoyable one, and on the ride to the beach appeared to be making a distinct effort to be gay and sprightly. When they reached the house, John Quincy repeated to his aunt Mrs. Maynard's invitation. "'Better come along,' he urged. "'Perhaps I will,' she answered. "'I'll see.' The day passed quietly, and it was not until evening that the monotony was broken. Leaving the dining room with his aunt and Barbara, John Quincy was handed a cablegram. He hastily opened it. It had been sent from Boston. Evidently, Agatha Parker, overwhelmed by the crude impossibility of the West, had fled home again, and John Quincy's brief San Francisco or nothing had followed her there. Hence the delay. The cablegram said simply, Nothing. Agatha. John Quincy crushed it in his hand. He tried to suffer a little, but it was no use. He was a mighty happy man. The end of a romance. No, there had never been any nonsense of that kind between them. Just an affectionate regard too slight to stand the strain of parting. Agatha was younger than he. She would marry some nice proper boy who had no desire to roam. And John Quincy Winterslip would read of her wedding in the San Francisco papers. He found Miss Minerva alone in the living room. It's none of my business, she said, but I'm wondering what was in your cablegram. Nothing, he answered truthfully. All the same, you were very pleased to get it. He nodded. Yes, I imagine nobody was ever so happy over nothing before. Good heavens, she cried. Have you given up grammar too? I'm thinking of it. How about going down to the beach with me? She shook her head. Someone is coming to look at the house, a leading lawyer, I believe he is. He's thinking of buying, and I feel I should be here to show him about. Barbara appears so listless and disinterested. Tell Sally Maynard I may drop in later. At a quarter to eight, John Quincy took his bathing suit and wandered down Kalia Road. It was another of those nights. A bright moon was riding high. From a bungalow buried under purple alamander came the soft croon of Hawaiian music. Through the hedges of flaming hibiscus he caught again the exquisite odours of this exotic island. Mrs. Maynard's big house was a particularly unlovely type of New England architecture, but a hundred flowering vines did much to conceal that fact. John Quincy found his hostess enthroned in her great airy drawing-room, surrounded by a handsome laughing group of the best people. Pleasant people, too. As she introduced him, he began to wonder if he hadn't been missing a great deal of congenial companionship. I dragged him here against his will, the old lady explained. I felt I owed it to Hawaii. He's been associating with a riffraff long enough. They insisted that he take an enormous chair, pressed cigarettes upon him, showered him with hospitable attentions. 
As he sat down and the chatter was resumed, he reflected that here was as civilized a company as Boston itself could offer. And why not? Most of these families came originally from New England and had kept in their exile the old ideals of culture and caste. It might interest Beacon Street to know, Mrs. Maynard said, that long before the days of 49, the people of California were sending their children over here to be educated in the missionary schools and importing their wheat from here too. Go on, tell him the other one, Aunt Sally, laughed a pretty girl in blue. That about the first printing press in San Francisco being brought over from Honolulu. Madame Maynard shrugged her shoulders. Oh, what's the use? We're so far away New England will never get us straight. John Quincy looked up to see Carlotta Egan in the doorway. A moment later Lieutenant Booth of Richmond appeared at her side. It occurred to the young man from Boston that the fleet was rather overdoing its stop at Honolulu. Mrs. Maynard rose to greet the girl. Come in, my dear. You know most of these people. She turned to the others. This is Miss Egan, a neighbour of mine on the beach. It was amusing to note that most of these people knew Carlotta too. John Quincy smiled. The British admiralty and the soap business. It must have been rather an ordeal for the girl, but she saw it through with a sweet graciousness that led John Quincy to reflect that she would be at home in England, if she went there. Carlotta sat down on a sofa, and while Lieutenant Booth was busily arranging a cushion at her back, John Quincy dropped down beside her. The sofa was fortunately too small for three. I rather expected to see you, he said in a low voice. I was brought here to meet the best people of Honolulu, and the way I see it you're the best of all. She smiled at him, and again the chatter of small talk filled the room. Presently the voice of a tall young man with glasses rose above the general hubbub. They got a cable from Joe Clark out at the country club this afternoon, he announced. The din ceased and everyone listened with interest. Clarks are professional, explained the young man to John Quincy. He went over a month ago to play in the British Open. Did he win? asked the girl in blue. He was put out by Hagen in the semi-finals, the young man said but he had the distinction of driving the longest ball ever seen on the St. Andrew's course. Why shouldn't he? asked an older man. He's got the strongest wrists I ever saw on anybody. John Quincy sat up, suddenly interested. How do you account for that? he asked. The older man smiled. We've all got pretty big wrists out here, he answered. Surfboarding, that's what does it. Joe Clark was a champion at one time, body surfing and board surfing too. He used to disappear for hours in the rollers out by the reef. The result was a marvellous wrist development. I've seen him drive a golf ball 380 yards. Yes, sir, I'll bet he made those Englishmen sit up and take notice. While John Quincy was thinking this over, someone suggested that it was time for the swim and confusion reigned. A Chinese servant led the way to the dressing rooms, which opened off the lanai, and the young people trooped joyously after him. I'll be waiting for you on the beach, John Quincy said to Carlotta Egan. I came with Johnny, you know, she reminded him. I know all about it, he answered. But it was the weekend you promised to the Navy. People who try to stretch their weekend through the following Wednesday night deserve all they get. She laughed. I'll look for you, she agreed. He donned his bathing suit hastily in a room filled with flying clothes and great waving brown arms. Lieutenant Booth, he noted with satisfaction, was proceeding at a leisurely pace. Hurrying through a door that opened directly on the beach, he waited under a nearby how tree. Presently Carlotta came, slender and fragile looking in the moonlight. Ah, oh, here you are, John Quincy cried. The farthest float. The farthest float it is she answered. They dashed into the warm silvery water and swam gaily off. Five minutes later they sat on the float together. The light on Diamond Head was winking. The lanterns of Sampans twinkled out beyond the reef. The shoreline of Honolulu was outlined by a procession of blinking stars controlled by dynamos. In the bright heavens hung a lunar rainbow, one colourful end in the Pacific and the other tumbling into the foliage ashore. A gorgeous setting in which to be young and in love, and free to speak at last. John Quincy moved closer to the girl's side. 
"'Great night, isn't it?' he said. "'Wonderful,' she answered softly. "'Carrie, I want to tell you something, and that's why I brought you out here, away from the others.' Somehow, she interrupted, it doesn't seem quite fair to Johnny. Never mind him. Has it ever occurred to you that my name's Johnny too? She laughed. Oh, but it couldn't be. What do you mean? I mean, I simply couldn't call you that. You're too dignified and, and remote. John Quincy. I believe I could call you John Quincy. Well, make up your mind. You'll have to call me something, because I'm going to be hanging round pretty constantly in the future. Yes, my dear, I'll probably turn out to be about the least remote person in the world. That is, if I can make you see the future the way I see it. Carrie, dearest. A gurgle sounded behind them, and they turned around. Lieutenant Booth was climbing onto the raft. Swam the last fifty yards under water to surprise you, he sputtered. Well, you succeeded said John Quincy, without enthusiasm. The lieutenant sat down with the manner of one book to remain indefinitely. I'll tell the world it's some night, he offered. Speaking of the world, when do you fellows leave Honolulu? asked John Quincy. I don't know. Tomorrow, I guess. Me, I don't care if we never go. Hawaii is not so easy to leave, is it, Carrie? She shook her head. Hardest place I know of, Johnny. I shall have to be sailing presently, and I know what a wrench it will be. Perhaps I'll follow the example of the wirely, the swimmer, and leave the boat when it passes Wakiki. They lolled for a moment in silence. Suddenly John Quincy sat up. What was that you said? he asked. About Waoli. Didn't I ever tell you? He was one of our best swimmers, and for years they tried to get him to go to the mainland to take part in athletic meets, like Duke Kahanamoku. But he was a sentimentalist. He couldn't bring himself to leave Hawaii. Finally they persuaded him, and one sunny morning he sailed out on the Matsonia with a very sad face. When the ship was opposite Wakiki, he slipped overboard and swam ashore. And that was that. He never got on a ship again. You see... John Quincy was on his feet. What time was it when we left the beach? He asked in a low, tense voice. About 8.30, said Booth. John Quincy talked very fast. That means I've got just 30 minutes to get ashore, dress and reach the dock before the President Tyler sails. I'm sorry to go, but it's vital, vital. Carrie, I had started to tell you something. I don't know when I'll get back, but I must see you when I do, either at Mrs. Maynard's or the hotel. Will you wait up for me? She was startled by the seriousness of his tone. Yes, I'll be waiting, she told him. That's great. He hesitated a moment. It was a risky business to leave the girl you love on a float in the moonlight with a handsome naval officer. But it had to be done. I'm off, he said, and dove. When he came up, he heard the lieutenant's voice. Say, old man, that dive was all wrong. You let me show you. Go to the devil, muttered John Quincy wetly, and swam with long, powerful strokes toward the shore. Mad with haste, he plunged into the dressing room, donned his clothes, then dashed out again. No time for apologies to his hostess. He ran along the beach to the winter slip house. Haku was dozing in the hall. Wicky, wicky, shouted John Quincy. Tell the chauffeur to get the roadster into the drive and start the engine. Wake up! Travel! Where's Miss Barbara? Last seen on the beach, began the startled Haku. On the bench under the how tree he found Barbara sitting alone. He stood panting before her. My dear, he said, I know at last who killed your father. She was on her feet. You do? Yes. Shall I tell you? No, she said. No, I can't bear to hear. It's too horrible. Then you've suspected? Yes, just a suspicion, a feeling, an intuition. I couldn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. I went away to get it out of my mind. It's all too terrible. He put his hand on her shoulder. Poor Barbara, don't you worry. You won't appear in this in any way. I'll keep you out of it. What? What has happened? Can't stop now. Tell you later. He ran toward the drive. Miss Minerva appeared from the house. "'Haven't time to talk,' he cried, leaping into the roadster. "'But, John Quincy, a curious thing has happened. 
That lawyer who was here to look at the house, he said that Dan, just a week before he died, spoke to him about a new will. That's good, that's evidence, John Quincy cried. But why a new will? Surely Barbara was all he had. Listen to me, cut in John Quincy. You've delayed me already. Get the big car and go to the station. Tell that to Hallett. Tell him too that I'm on the President Tyler and to send Chan there at once. He stepped on the gas. By the clock in the automobile he had just seventeen minutes to reach the dock before the President Tyler would sail. He shot like a madman through the brilliant Hawaiian night. Kalakawa Avenue, smooth and deserted, proved a glorious speedway. It took him just eight minutes to travel the three miles to the dock. A bit of traffic and an angry policeman in the centre of the city caused the delay. A scattering of people in the dim pier shed waited for the imminent sailing of the liner. John Quincy dashed through them and up the gangplank. The second officer, Hepworth, stood at the top. "'Hello, Mr. Winterslip,' he said. "'You sailing?' "'No, but let me aboard.' "'I'm sorry. We're about to draw in the plank.' "'No, no, you mustn't. This is life and death. Hold off just a few minutes. There's a steward named Bowker. I must find him at once. Life and death, I tell you.' Hepworth stood aside. "'Oh, well, in that case. But please hurry, sir. I will.' John Quincy passed him on the run. He went on his way to the cabins presided over by Bowker when a tall figure caught his eye. A man in a long green ulster and a battered green hat, a hat John Quincy had last seen on the links of the Ohu Country Club. The tall figure moved up on a stairway to the topmost deck. John Quincy followed. He saw the ulster disappear into one of the deluxe cabins. Still he followed and pushed open the cabin door. The man in the ulster was back too, but he swung round suddenly. "'Ah, Mr. Jennison,' John Quincy cried. "'Were you thinking of sailing on this boat?' For an instant Jennison stared at him. "'I was,' he said quietly. "'Forget it,' John Quincy answered. "'You're going ashore with me.' "'Really? What is your authority?' "'No authority whatever,' said the boy grimly. "'I'm taking you, that's all.' Jennison smiled, but there was a gleam of hate behind it, and in John Quincy's heart, usually so gentle and civilised, there was hate too as he faced this man. He thought of Dan Winterslip, dead on his cot. He thought of Jennison walking down the gangplank with them that morning they landed, Jennison putting his arm about poor Barbara when she faltered under the blow. He thought of the shots fired at him from the bush, of the red-haired man battering him in that red room. Well, he must fight again. No way out of it. The siren of the President Tyler sounded a sharp warning. You get out of here, said Jennison through his teeth. I'll go with you to the gangplank. He stopped as the disadvantages of that plan came home to him. His right hand went swiftly to his pocket. Inspired, John Quincy seized a filled water bottle and hurled it at the man's head. Jennison dodged. The bottle crashed through one of the windows. The clatter of glass rang through the night, but no one appeared. John Quincy saw Jennison leap toward him, something gleaming in his hand. Stepping aside, he threw himself on the man's back and forced him to his knees. He seized the wrist of Jennison's right hand, which held the automatic, in a firm grip. They kept that posture for a moment, and then Jennison began slowly to rise to his feet. The hand that held the pistol began to tear away. John Quincy shut his teeth and sought to maintain his grip, but he was up against a more powerful and antagonist than the red-haired sailor. He was outclassed and the realisation of it crept over him with a sickening force. Jennison was on his feet now, the right hand nearly free. Another moment. What then? John Quincy wondered. This man had no intention of letting him go ashore. He had changed that plan the moment he put it into words. A muffled shot and later in the night when the ship was well out on the Pacific, John Quincy thought of Boston, his mother. He thought of Colotta waiting his return. He summoned his strength for one last desperate effort to renew his grip. A serene, ivory-coloured face appeared suddenly at the broken window. An arm with a weapon was extended through the jagged opening. Relinquish the firearms, Mr. Jennison, commanded Charlie Chan or I am forced to make fatal insertion in vital organ belonging to you. 
Jennison's pistol dropped to the floor, and John Quincy staggered back against the berth. At that instant the door opened and Hallett, followed by the detective, Spencer, came in. "'Hello, Winterslip. What are you doing here?' the captain said. He thrust a paper into one of the pockets of the green ulster. "'Come along, Jennison,' he said. "'We want you.' Limply John Quincy followed them from the stateroom. Outside they were joined by Chan. At the top of the gangplank Hallett paused. "'We'll wait a minute for Hepworth,' he said. John Quincy put his hand on Chan's shoulder. "'Charlie, how can I ever thank you? You saved my life.' Chan bowed. "'My own pleasure is not to be worded. I have saved a life here and there, but never before, one that had beginning in cultured city of Boston, always a happy item on the golden scroll of memory.' Hepworth came up. "'It's all right,' he said. "'The captain has agreed to delay our sailing one hour. I'll go to the station with you.' On the way down the gangplank, Chan turned to John Quincy. Speaking heartily for myself, I congratulate your bravery. It is clear you leaped upon this Jennison with vigorous and triumphant mood of heart, but he would have pushed you down. He would have conquered. And why? The answer is such powerful wrists. A great surfboarder, eh? John Quincy said. Chan looked at him keenly. You are no person's fool. Ten years ago, this Harry Jennison, a champion swimmer in all Hawaii. I extract that news from ancient sporting pages of Honolulu Journal, but he have not been in the water much here lately, pursuing the truth further, not since the night he killed Dan Winterslip. End of section 21「Section twenty two of the House Without a Key by Alda Biggers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section twenty two. The light streams through. They moved on through the pier shed to the street, where Hepworth, Jennison, and the three policemen got into Hallett's car. The captain turned to John Quincy. You coming, Mr. Winterslip? he inquired. I've got my own car, the boy explained. I'll follow you in that. The roadster was not performing at its best, and he reached the station house a good five minutes after the policeman. He noted Dan Winterslip's big limousine parked in the street outside. In Hallett's room he found the captain and Chan closeted with a third man. It took a second glance at the latter to identify him as Mr. Saladin, for the little man of the lost teeth now appeared a great deal younger than John Quincy had thought him. Ah, oh, Mr. Winterslip remarked Hallett. He turned to Saladin. Say, Larry, you've got me into a heap of trouble with this boy. He accused me of trying to shield you. I wish you'd loosen up for him. Saladin smiled. Why, I don't mind. My job out here is about finished. Of course Mr. Winterslip will keep what I tell him under his hat. Naturally, replied John Quincy. He noticed that the man spoke with no trace of a lisp. I perceive you have found your teeth, he added. Oh, yes, I found them in my trunk where I put them the day I arrived at Wakiki, answered Saladin. When my teeth were knocked out twenty years ago in a football game, I was broken-hearted, but the loss has been a great help to me in my work. A man hunting his bridge work in the water is a figure of ridicule and mirth. No one ever thinks of connecting him with serious affairs. He can prowl about the beach to his heart's content. Mr. Winterslip, I am a special agent of the Treasury Department sent out here to break up the opium ring. My name, of course, is not Saladin. Oh, said John Quincy, I understand at last. I am glad you do, remarked Hallett. I don't know whether you're familiar with the way our opium smugglers work. The dope is brought in from the Orient on tramp steamers, the Mary S. Allison, for example, when they arrive off Wakiki, they knock together a few small rafts and load them with tins of the stuff. A fleet of little boats supposedly out there for the fishing pick up these rafts and bring the dope ashore. It's taken downtown and hidden on ships bound for Frisco, usually those that ply only between here and the mainland because they're not so closely watched at the other end. But it just happened that the quartermaster of the President Tyler is one of their go-betweens, we searched his cabin this evening and found it packed with the stuff. The quartermaster of the President Tyler, repeated John Quincy. 
That's Dick Kohler's friend. Yeah, I'm coming to Dick. He's been in charge of the pickup fleet here. He was out on that business the night of the murder. Saladin saw him and told me all about it in that note, which was my reason for letting the boy go. I owe you an apology, John Quincy said. Oh, that's all right. Hallett was in a great good humour. Larry here has got some of the higher-ups, too. For instance, he's discovered that Jennison is the lawyer for the ring, defending any of them who were caught and brought before the commissioner. The fact has no bearing on Dan Winterslip's murder, unless Winterslip knew about it, and that was one of the reasons he didn't want Jennison to marry his girl. Saladin stood up. I'll turn the quartermaster over to you, he said. In view of this other charge, you can of course have Jennison, too. That's all for me. I'll go along. See you tomorrow, Larry, Hallett answered. Saladin went out and the captain turned to John Quincy. Well, my boy, this is our big night. I don't know what you were doing in Jennison's cabin, but if you picked him for the murderer, I'll say you're good. That's just what I had done, John Quincy told him. By the way, have you seen my aunt? She's got hold of a rather interesting bit of information. I've seen her, Hallett said. She's with the prosecutor now, telling it to him. By the way, Green's waiting for us. Come along. They went into the prosecutor's office. Green was alert and eager. A stenographer was at his elbow, and Miss Minerva sat near his desk. Hello, Mr. Winterslip, he said. What do you think of our police force now? Pretty good, eh? Pretty good. Sit down, won't you? He glanced through some papers on his desk while John Quincy, Hallett and Chan found chairs. I don't mind telling you, this thing has knocked me all in a heap. Harry Jennison and I are old friends. I had lunch with him at the club only yesterday. I'm going to proceed a little differently than I would with an ordinary criminal. John Quincy half rose from his chair. Don't get excited, Green smiled. Jennison will get all that's coming to him, friendship or no friendship. What I mean is that if I can save the territory the expense of a long trial by dragging a confession out of him at once i intend to do it he's coming in here in a moment and i propose to reveal my whole hand to him from start to finish that may seem foolish but it isn't for i hold aces all aces and he'll know it as quickly as anyone the door opened spencer ushered jennison into the room and then withdrew the accused man stood there, proud, haughty, defiant, a viking of the tropics, a blond giant at bay but unafraid. Hello, Jennison, Green said. I'm mighty sorry about this. You ought to be, Jennison replied. You're making an awful fool of yourself. What is this damned nonsense anyhow? Sit down, said the prosecutor sharply. He indicated a chair on the opposite side of the desk. He had already turned the shade on his desk lamp so the light would shine full in the face of anyone sitting there. "'That lamp bother you, Harry?' he asked. "'Why should it?' Jennison demanded. "'Good,' smiled Green. "'I believe Captain Hallett served you with a warrant on the boat. Have you looked at it by any chance?' "'I have.' The prosecutor leaned across the desk. "'Murder, Jennison!' Jennison's expression did not change. Damn nonsense, as I told you. Why should I murder anyone? Ah, the motive, Green replied. You're quite right. We should begin with that. Do you wish to be represented here by counsel? Jennison shook his head. I guess I am lawyer enough to puncture this silly business, he replied. Very well. Green turned to his stenographer. Get this. The man nodded and the prosecutor addressed Miss Minerva. Miss Winterslip will start with you. Miss Minerva leaned forward. Mr. Dan Winterslip's house on the beach has, as I told you, been offered for sale by his daughter. After dinner this evening, a gentleman came to look at it, a prominent lawyer named Haley. As we went over the house, Mr. Haley mentioned that he had met Dan Winterslip on the street a week before his death and that my cousin had spoken to him about coming in shortly to draw up a new will. He did not say what the provisions of the will were to be, nor did he ever carry out his intention. Ah, yes, said Green. But Mr. Jennison here was your cousin's lawyer. He was. If he wanted to draw a new will, he wouldn't ordinarily have gone to a stranger for that purpose. Not ordinarily, unless he had some good reason. 
Precisely. Unless, for instance, the will has some connection with Harry Jennison. I object, Jennison cried. This is mere conjecture. So it is, Green answered. But we're not in court. We can conjecture if we like. Suppose, Miss Winterslip, the will was concerned with Jennison in some way. What do you imagine the connection to have been? I don't have to imagine, replied Miss Minerva. I know. Ah, oh, that's good. You know. Go on. Before I came down here tonight, I had a talk with my niece. She admitted that her father knew she and Jennison were in love, and that he had bitterly opposed the match. He had even gone so far as to say he would disinherit her if she went through with it. Then the new will Dan Winterslip intended to make would probably have been to the effect that in the event his daughter married Jennison, she was not to inherit a penny of his money. There isn't any doubt of it, said Miss Minerva firmly. You asked for a motive, Jennison, Green said. That's motive enough for me. Everybody knows you're money mad. You wanted to marry Winterslip's daughter, the richest girl in the islands. He said you couldn't have her, not with the money too. But you're not the sort to make a penniless marriage. You were determined to get both Barbara Winterslip and her father's property. Only one person stood in your way, Dan Winterslip, and that's how you happened to be on his lanai that Monday night. Wait a minute, Jennison protested. I wasn't on his lanai. I was on board the President Tyler, and everybody knows that ship didn't land its passengers until nine the following morning. I'm coming to that, Green told him. Just now, by the way, what time is it? Jennison took from his pocket a watch on the end of a slender chain. It's a quarter past nine. Ah, yes. Is that the watch you usually carry? It is. Ever wear a wrist watch? Jennison hesitated. Occasionally. Only occasionally. The prosecutor rose and came round his desk. Let me see your left wrist, please. Jennison held out his arm. It was tanned a deep brown, but on the wrist was etched in white the outline of a watch and its encircling strap. Green smiled. Yes, you've worn a wrist watch, and you've worn it pretty constantly from the look of things. He took a small object from his pocket and held it in front of Jennison. This watch, perhaps. Jennison regarded it stonily. Ever seen it before? Green asked. No. Well, suppose we try it on anyhow. He put the watch in position and fastened it. I can't help noting, Harry, he continued, that it fits rather neatly over that white outline on your wrist, and the prong of the buckle falls naturally into the most worn of the holes on the strap. What of that? asked Jennison. Oh, coincidence, probably. You have abnormally large wrists, however. Surfboarding, swimming, eh? But that's something else I'll speak of later. He turned to Miss Minerva. Will you please come over here, Miss Winterslip? She came, and as she reached his side, the prosecutor suddenly bent over and switched off the light on his desk. Save for a faint glimmer through a transom, the room was in darkness. Miss Minerva was conscious of dim huddled figures, a circle of white faces, a tense silence. The prosecutor was lifting something slowly toward her startled eyes. A watch worn on a human wrist, a watch with an illuminated dial on which the figure too was almost obliterated. Look at that and tell me, came the prosecutor's voice. You have seen it before? I have, she answered firmly. Where? In the dark, in Dan Winterslip's living room, just after midnight, the 30th of June. Green flashed on the light. Thank you, Miss Winterslip. He retired behind his desk and pressed a button. You identify it by some distinguishing mark, I presume? I do, the numeral too, which is pretty well obscured. Spencer appeared at the door. Send the Spaniard in, Green ordered. That is all for the present, Miss Winterslip. Cabrera entered, and his eyes were frightened as they looked at Jennison. At a nod from the prosecutor, Chan removed the wristwatch and handed it to the Spaniard. "'You know that watch, Jose?' Green asked. "'I... I... yes,' answered the boy. "'Don't be afraid. 
Green urged. Nobody's going to hurt you. I want you to repeat the story you told me this afternoon. You have no regular job. You are a sort of confidential errand boy for Mr. Jennison here. I was. Yes, that's all over now. You can speak out. On the morning of Wednesday, July 2nd, you were in Mr. Jennison's office. He gave you this wristwatch and told you to take it out and get it repaired. Something was the matter with it. It wasn't running. You took it to a big jewellery store. What happened? The man said it is very badly hurt. To fix it would cost more than a new watch. I go back and tell Mr. Jennison. He laugh and say it is mine as a gift. Precisely. Green referred to a paper on his desk. Late in the afternoon of Thursday, July 3rd, you sold the watch. To whom? To Lao Ho, Chinese jeweller in Mauna Kea Street. On Saturday evening, maybe six o'clock, Mr. Jennison telephoned my home much excited. Must have watch again and will pay any price. I speed to Lao Ho's store. Watch is sold once more, now to unknown Japanese. Late at night I see Mr. Jennison and he curse me with anger. Get the watch, he says. I have been hunting, but I could not find it. Green turned to Jennison. You were a little careless with that watch, Harry. But no doubt you figured you were pretty safe. You had your alibi. Then, too, when Hallett detailed the clues to you on Winterslip's lanai the morning after the crime, he forgot to mention that someone had seen the watch. It was one of those happy accidents that are all we have to count on in this work. By Saturday night you realised your danger. Just how you discovered it, I don't know. I do, John Quincy interrupted. What? What's that? said Green. On Saturday afternoon, John Quincy told him, I played golf with Mr. Jennison. On our way back to town we talked over the clues in this case, and I happened to mention the wristwatch. I can see now it was the first he had heard of it. He was to dine with us at the beach, but he asked to be put down at his office to sign a few letters. I waited below. It must have been then that he called up this young man in an effort to locate the watch. Great stuff, said Green enthusiastically. That finishes the watch, Jennison. I am surprised you wore it, but you probably knew that it would be vital to you to keep track of the time, and you figured rightly that it would not be immediately affected by the salt water. What the devil are you talking about? demanded Jennison. Again Green pressed a button on his desk. Spencer appeared at once. Take this Spaniard, the prosecutor directed, and bring in Hepworth and the quartermaster. He turned again to Jennison. I'll show you what I'm talking about in just a minute. On the night of June 30th you were a passenger on the President Tyler, which was lying by until dawn out near the channel entrance. I was. No passengers were landed from that ship until the following morning. That's a matter of record. Very well. The second officer of the President, Tyler, came in, followed by a big hulking sailorman John Quincy recognised as the quartermaster of that vessel. He was interested to know to ring on the man's right hand, and his mind went back to that encounter in the San Francisco attic. Mr. Hepworth, the prosecutor began, on the night of June 30th, your ship reached this port too late to dock. You anchored off Waikiki. On such an occasion, who is on deck, say, from midnight on? The second officer, Hepworth told him. In this case, myself. Also, the quartermaster. The accommodation ladder is let down the night before. Usually, yes, it was let down that night. Who was stationed near it? The quartermaster. Ah, yes, you were in charge then on the night of June 30th. Did you notice anything unusual on that occasion? Hepworth nodded. I did. The quartermaster appeared to be under the influence of liquor. At three o'clock I found him dozing near the accommodation ladder. I roused him. When I came back from checking up the anchor bearings before turning in at dawn, about 4.30, he was dead to the world. I put him in his cabin, and the following morning I, of course, reported him. You notice nothing else out of the ordinary? Nothing, sir, Hepworth replied. Thank you very much. Now you, Green turned to the quartermaster. You were drunk on duty the night of June 30th. Why did you get the booze? The man hesitated. Before you say anything, let me give you a bit of advice. The truth, my man, 
You're in pretty bad already. I'm not making any promises, but if you talk straight here it may help you in that other matter. If you lie, it will go that much harder with you. I ain't going to lie, promised the quartermaster. All right, where did you get your liquor? The man nodded toward Jennison. He gave it to me. He did, eh? Tell me all about it. I met him on deck just after midnight. We were still moving. I knew him before, him and me. In the opium game, both of you, I understand that. You met him on deck. I did, and he says you're on watch tonight, eh? And I says I am. So he slips me a little bottle and says this will help you pass the time. I ain't a drinking man, so help me I ain't. And I took just a nip, but there was something in that whiskey, I'll swear to it. My head was all funny-like, and the next I knew I was waked up in my cabin with the bad news I was wanted above. What became of that bottle? I dropped it overboard on my way to see the captain. I didn't want nobody to find it. Did you see anything the night of June 30th? Anything peculiar? I seen plenty, sir. But it was that drink. Nothing you would want to hear about. All right. The prosecutor turned to Jennison. Well, Harry, you drugged him, didn't you? Why? Because you were going ashore, eh? Because you knew he'd be on duty at that ladder when you returned, and you didn't want him to see you. So you dropped something into that whisky. Guesswork, cut in Jennison, still unruffled. I used to have some respect for you as a lawyer, but it's all gone now. If this is the best you can offer. But it isn't, said Green pleasantly. Again he pushed the button. I've something much better, Harry, if you'll only wait. He turned to Hepworth. There's a steward on your ship named Bowker he began, and John Quincy thought that Jennison stiffened. How has he been behaving lately? Well, he got pretty drunk in Hong Kong, Hepworth answered, but that, of course, was the money. What money? It's this way. The last time we sailed out of Honolulu Harbour for the Orient over two weeks ago, I was in the purser's office. It was just as we were passing Diamond Head. Bowker came in, and he had a big fat envelope that he wanted to deposit in the purser's safe. He said it contained a lot of money. The purser wouldn't be responsible for it without seeing it, so Bowker slipped the envelope, and there were ten one hundred dollar bills. The purser made another package of it and put it in the safe. He told me Bowker took out a couple of the bills when we reached Hong Kong. Where would a man like Bowker get all that money? I can't imagine. He said he had put over a business deal in Honolulu, but, well, we knew Bowker. The door opened. Evidently Spencer guessed who was wanted this time, for he pushed Bowker into the room. The steward of the President Tyler was bedraggled and bleary. Hello, Bowker, said the prosecutor. Sober now, aren't you? I'll tell the world I am, replied Bowker. They've walked me to San Francisco and back. Can, can I sit down? Of course, Green smiled. This afternoon, while you were still drunk, you told a story to Willie Chan out at Okamoto's auto stand on Kalakawa Avenue. Later on, early this evening, you repeated it to Captain Hallett and me. I'll have to ask you to go over it again. Bowker glanced toward Jennison, then quickly looked away. Always ready to oblige, he answered. You're a steward on the President Tyler, Green continued. On your last trip over here from the mainland, Mr. Jennison occupied one of your rooms, number 97. He was alone in it, I believe. All alone. He paid extra for the privilege, I hear. Always travelled that way. Room 97 was on the main deck, not far from the accommodation ladder. Yes, that's right. Tell us what happened after you anchored off Wakiki the night of June 30th. Bowker adjusted his gold-rimmed glasses with the gesture of a man about to make an after-dinner speech. Well, I was up pretty late that night. Mr. Winterslip here had loaned me some books. There was one I was particularly interested in. I wanted to finish it so I could give it to him to take ashore in the morning. It was nearly two o'clock when I finally got through it, and I was feeling stuffy, so I went on deck for a breath of air. You stopped not far from the accommodation ladder? Yes, sir, I did. Did you notice the quartermaster? Yes, he was sound asleep in a deck chair. I went over and leaned on the rail. The ladder was just beneath me. I had been standing there a few minutes when suddenly somebody came up out of the water and put his hands on the lowest rung. I drew back quickly and stood in a shadow. Well, pretty soon this man comes creeping up the ladder to the deck. 
He was barefooted and all in black, black pants and shirt. I watched him. He went over and bent over the quartermaster, then started toward me down the deck. He was walking on tiptoe, but even then I didn't get wise to the fact anything was wrong. I stepped out of the shadow. Fine night for a swim, Mr. Jennison, I said, and I saw at once that I had made a social error. He gave one jump in my direction, and his hands closed on my throat. I thought my time had come. He was wet, wasn't he? Green asked. Dripping, he left a trail of water on the deck. Did you notice a watch on his wrist? Yes, but you can bet I didn't make any study of it. I had other things to think about just then. I managed to sort of ooze out of his grip, and I told him to cut it out or I'd yell. Look here, he says. You and I can talk business, I guess. Come into my cabin. But I wasn't wanting any tete-a-tete -tete with him in any cabin. I said I'd see him in the morning, and after I'd promised to say nothing to anybody, he let me go. Then I went to bed, pretty much puzzled. The next morning when I went into his cabin, there he was all fresh and rosy and smiling. If I'd had so much as a whiff of booze the night before, I'd have thought I never saw what I did. I went in there thinking I might get a hundred dollars out of the affair, but the minute he spoke I began to smell important money. He said no one must know about his swim the night before. How much did I want? Well, I held my breath and said ten thousand dollars, and I nearly dropped dead when he answered I could have it. Bowker turned to John Quincy. I don't know what you'll think of me. I don't know what Tim would think. I'm not a crook by nature, but I was fed up and choking over that steward job. I wanted a little newspaper of my own, and up to that minute I couldn't see myself getting it. And you must remember that I didn't know then what was in the air. Murder. Later, when I did find out, I was scared to breathe. I didn't know what they could do to me. He turned to Green. That's all fixed, he said. I've promised you immunity, the prosecutor answered. I'll keep my word. Go on, you agreed to accept the ten thousand. I did. I went to his office at twelve. One of the conditions was that I could stay on the President Tyler until she got back to San Francisco, and after that I was never to show my face out this way again. It suited me. Mr. Jennison introduced me to this Cabrera, who was to chaperone me the rest of that day. I'll say he did. When I went aboard the ship, he handed me a thousand dollars in an envelope. When I came back this time, I was to spend the day with Cabrera and get the other nine grand when I sailed. This morning when we tied up, I saw the Spaniard on the dock, but by the time I'd landed, he had disappeared. I met this Willie Chan and we had a large day. This fusel oil they sell out here loosened my tongue, but I'm not sorry. Of course the rosy dream has faded and it's my flat feet on the deck from now to the end of time, but the shore isn't so much any more, with all their bar rooms under cover, and this sea life keeps a man out in the open air. As I say, I'm not sorry I talked. I can look any man in the eye again and tell him to go to... He glanced at Miss Minerva. Madam, I will not name the precise locality. Green stood. Well, Jennison, there's my case. I've tipped it all off to you, but I wanted you to see for yourself how airtight it is. There are two courses open to you. You can let this go to trial with a plea of not guilty, a long, humiliating ordeal for you, or you can confess here and now and throw yourself on the mercy of the court. If you're the sensible man I think you are, that's what you'll do. Jennison did not answer, did not even look at the prosecutor. It was a very neat idea, Green went on. I'll grant you that. Only one thing puzzles me. Did it come as the inspiration of the moment, or did you plan it all out in advance? You've been over to the mainland rather often of late. Were you waiting your chance? Anyhow, it came, didn't it? It came at last. And for a swimmer like you, child's play. You didn't need that ladder when you left the vessel. Perhaps you went overboard while the President Tyler was still moving. A quick, silent dive, a little way under water in case anyone was watching from the deck, and then a long but easy swim ashore. And there you were, on the beach at Wakiki. Not far away, Dan Winterslip was asleep on his lanai, with not so much as a locked door between you. Dan Winterslip, who stood between you and what you wanted. A little struggle, a quick thrust of your knife. Come on, Jennison, don't be a fool. It's the best way out for you now. A full confession. 
Jennison leapt to his feet, his eyes flashing. "'I'll see you in hell first, he cried. "'Very well, if you feel that way about it.' Green turned his back upon him and began a low-toned conversation with Hallett. Jennison and Charlie Chan were together on one side of the desk. Chan took out a pencil and accidentally dropped it on the floor. He stooped to pick it up. John Quincy saw that the butt of a pistol carried in Chan's hip pocket protruded from under his coat. He saw Jennison spring forward and snatch the gun. With a cry, John Quincy moved nearer, but Green seized his arm and held him. Charlie Chan seemed unaccountably oblivious to what was going on. Jennison put the muzzle of the pistol to his forehead and pulled the trigger. A sharp click, and that was all. The pistol fell from his hand. "'That's it,' cried Green triumphantly. "'That's my confession and not a word spoken. I've witnesses, Jennison. They all saw you. You couldn't stand the disgrace, a man in your position. You tried to kill yourself. With an empty gun.' He went over and patted Chan on the shoulder. "'A great idea, Charlie,' he said. "'Chan thought of it,' he added to Jennison. "'The Oriental mind, Harry. Rather subtle, isn't it?' But Jennison had dropped back into his chair and buried his face in his hands. "'I'm sorry,' said Green gently. "'But we've got you. Maybe you'll talk now.' Jennison looked up slowly. The defiance was gone from his face. It was lined and old. Maybe I will, he said hoarsely. End of section 22section 23 of the house without a key by alder biggers this librivox recording is in the public domain section 23 moonlight at the crossroads they filed out leaving jennison with green and the stenographer in the ante-room chan approached john quincy you go home decked in the shining garments of success he said one thought of tantalizing me a simultaneous moment you arrive at same conclusion we do to reach there, you must have leaped across considerable cavity. John Quincy laughed. I'll say I did. It came to me tonight. First, someone mentioned a golf professional with big wrists who drove a long ball. I had a quick flash of Jennison on the links here and his terrific drives. Big wrists, they told me, meant that a man was proficient in the water. Then someone else, a young woman, spoke of a champion swimmer who left a ship off Wakiki. That was the first time the idea of such a thing had occurred to me. I was pretty warm then, and I felt Bowker was the man who could verify my suspicion. When I rushed aboard the President, Tyler, to find him, I saw Jennison about to sail, and that confirmed my theory. I went after him. A brave performance, commented Chan. But as you can see, Charlie, I didn't have an iota of real evidence. Just guesswork. You were the one who furnished the proof. Proof are essential in this business, Chan replied. I'm tantalised too, Charlie. I remember you in the library. You were on the crack long before I was. How come? Chan grinned. Seated at our ease in All-American Restaurant that first night, you will recall I spoke of Chinese people as sensitive, like camera film. A look, a laugh, a gesture, something go click. Balka enters and hovering above says with alcoholic accent, I'm my own master, ain't I? In my mind, the click. He is not own master. I follow to dock. Behold, when Spaniard present envelope. But for days I am fogged. I can only learn Cabrera and Jennison are very close. Clues continue to burst into our countenance. The occasion remains suspensive. At the library I read of Jennison, the fine swimmer. After that, the watch and triumph. Miss Minerva moved on toward the door. May I have great honour to accompany you to car? asked Chan. Outside, John Quincy directed the chauffeur to return alone to Wakiki with the limousine. You're riding out with me, he told his aunt. I want to talk with you. She turned to Charlie Chan. I congratulate you. You've got brains and they count. He bowed low. From you that compliment grows rosy red. At this moment of parting my heart droops. My final wish, the snowy chilling days of winter and the scorching windless days of summer, may they all be the springtime for you. You're very kind, she said softly. John Quincy took his hand. It's been great fun knowing you, Charlie, he remarked. 
You will go again to the mainland, Chan said, the angry ocean rolling between us. I shall carry the memory of your friendship like a flower in my heart. John Quincy climbed into the car. And the parting may not be eternal, Chan added cheerfully. The joy of travel may yet be mine. I shall look forward to the day when I may call upon you in your home and shake a healthy hand. John Quincy started the car and slipped away. They left Charlie Chan standing like a great Buddha on the curb. Poor Barbara, said Miss Minerva presently. I dread to face her with this news. But then it's not altogether news as that. She told me she had been conscious of something wrong between her and Jennison ever since they landed. She didn't think he killed her father, but she believed he was involved in it somehow. She is planning to settle with Bray tomorrow and leave the next day, probably forever. I persuaded her to come to Boston for a long visit. You'll see her there. John Quincy shook his head. No, I shan't, but thanks for reminding me. I must go to the cable office at once. When he emerged from the office and again entered the car, he was smiling happily. In San Francisco, he explained, Roger accused me of being a Puritan survival. He ran over a little list of adventures he said had never happened to me. Well, most of them have happened now, and I cabled to tell him so. I also said I'd take that job with him. Miss Minerva frowned. Think it over carefully, she warned. San Francisco isn't Boston. The cultural standard is, I fancy, much lower. You'll be lonely there. Oh, no, I shan't. Someone will be there with me. At least I hope she will. Agatha. No, not Agatha. The cultural standard was too low for her. She's broken our engagement. Barbara, then. Not Barbara, either. But I've sometimes thought... You thought Barbara sent Jennison packing because of me. Jennison thought so, too. It's all clear now. That was why he tried to frighten me into leaving Honolulu and set his opium-running friends on me when I wouldn't go. But Barbara is not in love with me. We understand now why she broke her engagement. Neither Agatha nor Barbara, repeated Miss Minerva. Then who? You haven't met her yet. But that happy privilege will be yours before you sleep. The sweetest girl in the islands, or in the world. The daughter of Jim Egan, who you have been heard to refer to as a glorified beachcomber. Again, Miss Minerva frowned. It's a great risk, John Quincy. She hasn't our background. No, and that's a pleasant change. She's the niece of your old friend. You knew that. I did, answered Miss Minerva softly. Your dear friend of the eighties. What was it you said to me? If your chance ever comes. I hope you will be very happy, his aunt said. When you write it to your mother, be sure and mention Captain Cope of the British Admiralty. Poor Grace, that will be all she'll have to cling to, after the wreck. What wreck? The wreck of all her hopes for you. Nonsense, Mother will understand. She knows I'm a roaming winter slip, and when we roam, we roam. They found Madame Maynard seated in her living room with a few of her more elderly guests. From the beach came a sound of youthful revelry. Well, my boy, the old woman cried, it appears you couldn't stay away from your policeman friends one single evening after all. I give you up. John Quincy laughed. I'm pal now. By the way, Colotta Egan, is she? They're all out there somewhere, the hostess said. They came in for a bit of supper. By the way, there are sandwiches in the dining room and... Not just now, said John Quincy. Thank you so much. I'll see you again, of course. He dashed out on the sand. A group of young people under the how tree informed him that Colotta Egan was on the farthest float. Alone? Well, no, that naval lieutenant. He was, he reflected, as he hurried on toward the water, a bit fed up with the navy. That was hardly the attitude he should have taken, considering all the navy had done for him. But it was human, and John Quincy was human at last. For an instant he stood at the water's edge. His bathing suit was in the dressing room, but he never gave it a thought. He kicked off his shoes, tossed aside his coat, and plunged into the breakers. The blood of the wandering winter slips was racing through his veins, hot blood that tropical waters had ever been powerless to cool. Sure enough, Colotta Egan and Lieutenant Booth were together on the float. John Quincy climbed up beside them. Well, I'm back, he announced. I'll tell the world you're back, said the lieutenant, and all wet too. They sat there, 
Across a thousand miles of warm water the trade winds came to fan their cheeks. Just above the horizon hung the southern cross. The island lights trembled along the shore. The yellow eye on Diamond Head was winking. A gorgeous setting. Only one thing was wrong with it. It was rather crowded. John Quincy had an inspiration. Just as I hit the water, he remarked, I thought I heard you say something about my dive. Didn't you like it? It was rotten, replied the lieutenant amiably. You offered to show me what was wrong with it, I believe. Sure, if you want me to. By all means, said John Quincy. Learn one thing every day. That's my motto. Lieutenant Booth went to the end of the springboard. In the first place, always keep your ankles close together like this. I've got you, answered John Quincy. And hold your arms tight against your ears. The tighter the better, as far as I'm concerned. Then double up like a jackknife, continued the instructor. He doubled up like a jackknife and rose into the air. At the same instant, John Quincy seized the girl's hands. Listen to me. I can't wait another second. I want to tell you that I love you. You're mad, she cried. Mad about you, ever since that day on the ferry. But your people. What about my people? It's just you and I. We'll live in San Francisco. That is, if you love me. Well, I... In heaven's name be quick. That human submarine is floating around here under us. You love me, don't you? You'll marry me. Yes. He took her in his arms and kissed her. Only the wandering wind slips could kiss like that. The stay-at-homes had always secretly begrudged them the accomplishment. The girl broke away at last, breathless. Johnny, she cried. A sputter beside them, and Lieutenant Booth climbed onto the float, moist and panting. What's that? he gargled. She was speaking to me, cried John Quincy triumphantly. End of section 23 End of The House Without a Key by Alda Biggers